and unfortunately it was rescheduled due to COVID. Um, Dr. Farley and I worked together during my time as a faculty member at the University of Louisville, where she was my graduate assistant with our symphonic band. So uh, a little bit of trivia there for you. She is an absolutely incredible and wonderful person, and um, I just want to let her know how much I appreciate her. So we're coming up a little bit of this different uh, background here today, and hopefully you'll be able to see a few of the slides just for the first part of my presentation, and then I will um, take them off for the second half. Um, but I'm here today to speak with you about my own work and to discuss issues of systemic injustice and marginalization in arts education. My scholarly work in higher education has been to learn from and advocate for other music teachers in large urban districts who teach primarily students of color. My quest has been to center our profession's discourse around issues that affect those who have been historically marginalized within arts education and specifically music education. I currently serve as acting associate dean of the School of Music, Theater, and Dance at the University of Michigan and as associate professor of music education. I've published a lot on these topics, venturing from work that centers around music teaching in larger underserved districts like Chicago to work that focuses on gender gaps in academia and music education. My CV and my work in academia does not fully capture the passion of my heart, however, and who I am because who I am and what I most care about is deeply centered in my early work as a music teacher and band director in the Columbus City Schools, the largest school district in the state of Ohio, where I started teaching high school band, orchestra, and jazz band as a white teacher of students of color at the ripe old age of 22. Our schools were continually labeled as failing academically, but each and every day I saw my kids make tremendous sacrifices to be a part of our program taking city buses home and back after school from across town to make it to rehearsals, leaving work on the weekend at a minimum wage job, which helped provide their families with groceries and rent money, to come and join one of our weekly fundraisers to help us supplement our $0 school provided budget, fix our antiquated and duct tape instruments, buy sheet music that was not provided by the school, produce our own CD recordings, put on musicals and go on trips and perform at places like Disney World, which is what's shown, the White House Bicentennial and the Sugar Bowl in New Orleans. I'm exceptionally proud of the work that we did together, but most of all, proud of my kids. My kids, my Northern kids, and that is me probably at the age of 22 and my first year of teaching, deserve the absolute best of what the educational system could provide. And I saw firsthand how much being a part of a musical family meant to each of them. To watch them make music at the highest levels, despite our lack of resources, was profoundly inspiring to me as a young teacher. Years later, many of their words were captured in my book, and I reflect rather continually on the honor and privilege of having had the opportunity to be their teacher. My entire scholarly journey has revolved around an effort to keep the promise that I made to them to always take forth their story, to keep their faces in my mind as I journey through academia, and to ensure that students like mine have the opportunities they so richly deserve to experience the arts. Teaching, teaching at Northern High School will forever be my most profound professional experience, because it was there that I grew to understand how essential strong, comprehensive, sequential, and robust school arts programs are for all young people yet how tremendous the inequities are that exist with regard to access to these programs within under-resourced schools that disproportionately serve students of color. What are the arts? Are they a fringe extracurricular subject in our schools? Nice to incorporate, but all right to cut at the first sight, sign of budgetary trouble. Are they essential? Within modern society, the notion that one needs to be talented in the arts in order to participate has led to problems in how we may view their importance. The arts represent a fundamental part of the human experience, a way that human beings have always made sense of the world around them, a way to feel, a way to be, and a way to express. Each one of us likely turns on music when we turn on our car and head to work or school. We sing and play instruments in our houses of worship. Children put together their own plays for their parents in their homes, dressing up by using blankets as capes and using paper towel rolls as microphones. Families dance together at weddings and celebrations in order to express their joy. The arts belong to all of us. They play an essential and powerful role in how people view and experience the world 
as human beings. During times of crisis, the arts take on an even more central role. Arts education, too, means something different in times of crisis, like the ones we are in now. I think this is worth exploring if we are truly to determine whether providing the arts to all is a worthy goal. Down, take a look at some of the art that has been emerging from this particular moment in time. In the middle of COVID, in the middle of isolation, death, sickness, and worry, our students and communities, and particularly our students of color, have also experienced tremendous pain that has resulted in a social movement that has already resulted in change. Art, music, theater, dance, these are ways that our communities are sustaining themselves, promoting change, provoking thought, and demanding justice during this time like no other. I would encourage you to consider the role the arts have played in your own life since the beginning of the pandemic. Early on in the pandemic, one of the most scarce of supplies was at-home painting kits. They were selling out more quickly than they could be restocked. People turned to art, to music, to film as a way to cope, to express, and to create. This intrigues me to consider how the need for artistic expression emerges when we are most vulnerable and how our humanity craves the arts as a way to navigate the complexity of the world around us during times of crisis. Each of your own experiences, as you sit home during lockdown or even when things opened back up yet you had to remain distanced, how many times have you played music, made art, danced with your family, siblings or roommates, cooked or baked during this time? Why? Did you do it to prepare for an upcoming performance or exhibition? Or did you do it for yourself? because for you, it provided an outlet or an opportunity to feel during this time of so many mixed emotions. Just as the class has started this year, I have privilege to speak with the amazing fine and performing arts teachers at the Detroit Public Schools Community District. My first order of business was to thank them on behalf of their students and their families for the unpaid and often unnoticed extra work they have done this year to best serve their students within this time like no other. To me, their dedication is nothing less than awe-inspiring. It is my hope that they will be recognized and appreciated as the amazing and dedicated professionals who they are. If we have learned nothing else through this pandemic, I hope that we will carry with us an understanding that for many months, the entire fabric of our society hinged around our schools and our teachers. And so I will ask again, what are the arts? Are they a fringe extracurricular subject? Are they essential? Are they for everyone? Let me stop screen share and just talk a little more about this. The truth is that the arts belong to all of us just as much as they belong to the great masters or to the musicians of Motown. Empowering all children, young adults, and even ourselves to seize their musical, theatrical, artistic, and dancing selves every day seems indeed to be a worthy purpose, especially in times of crisis, of social strife, and of injustice. The reality of arts education today, however, is that the greatest access to the arts is provided within our most well-resourced schools for our most well-resourced children, provoking profound questions of equity, marginalization, and oppression that often follow racial and socioeconomic lines. In America, we have many schools that provide beautifully resourced arts programs, with access to trained art specialists who meet with their elementary students several times a week or their high school students every day. Surveys of parents reveal that overwhelmingly, they want their kids to have access to arts programs such as these. However, as a child, the zip code of the school you attend is what primarily determines your access to such programs. School funding structure, structures and existing systemic inequities in our schools essentially determine whether a child gets to have a theater, music, or dance home within their school experience, or whether they instead get to take a double block of reading or math to ensure that the school meets adequate progress according to testing structures that correlate directly with students' socioeconomic status. What we value as a democratic nation for our kids is most easily expressed and represented through those educational experiences that we provide through our public schools. And here is the crux of the problem, that the profound inequities that exist with regards to arts access within our schools essentially tell kids 
but there are some of them that deserve to have publicly supported opportunities to experience beauty, creativity, and connection with their own humanity, and other kids who don't deserve this opportunity. My kids at Northland deserved this, and so do the kids in Detroit, whose fine and performing arts teachers I just spoke with. Every kid deserves this opportunity. And therefore, we must re-examine these issues of inequity and marginalization embedded within our educational structures. My work focuses most specifically on the pre-K through 12 arts education experience. Yet, inequity, injustice, and marginalization in the arts cannot only be addressed within our public schools, although I would suggest that is a good place to start. The reality is that most arts educators who work with students of color look like me. They are white. Our teaching field is disproportionately white and disproportionately male. The music we play and the arts we perform are still predominantly composed by, performed by, conducted by, arranged by, and promoted by white cis male individuals. Although Black American music is a treasure of the entire world, it is generally absent from most of our academies. The financial dynamics associated with arts participation systematically exclude certain groups of students from even participating in the arts. For example, if you don't buy an expensive instrument early enough, or if your family can't pay for private lessons that could cost $200 a month or more for an extended period of time, and for certain instruments like violin and piano and others, if you don't start these lessons before you even enter middle school, you have a hard time gaining entrance into many college music programs so that you can become a music teacher. For a long time, these systems went unexamined. They just were what they were. And these systems reproduced themselves very successfully. When we only recognize within our admissions processes for undergraduate and graduate degree programs, and indeed for faculty searches, certain musics, certain resumes, certain repertoires, certain genres, certain styles of diction, certain dress, certain mannerisms, and certain definitions of what constitutes excellence, we maintain the status quo in powerful and exclusionary ways. However, this moment, I would argue, is a moment like no other in our institutions of higher education. Having the pandemic of COVID occur alongside the pandemic of racial injustice has propelled our young people to declare that they no longer will accept the status quo and they are not asking, they are demanding that we respond with action. Movements to decolonize the music and arts curricula and to re-examine the predominant whiteness of the academy and of classical music are being led by our students. I know that this work is hard. I know that so many of our students are weary to have to take this up at the same time as you yourselves are feeling the pressure of the world, world's complexity. But this work is ever so important. I see your work here in the School of Music through programs like the Lift Fund, which provides attention to issues of inequity within arts education, and through your Committee on Actionable Anti-Racism and Inclusion. There is, right now, a generation gap we are seeing in the ways that we all have been prepared to examine the world of the arts. And you, our amazing students, are the ones who have the depth of understanding, empathy, and compassion to lead the way on these issues. At Michigan, I have seen these conversations evolve in powerful ways over the last few months, and I am truly excited about the possibilities that lie ahead. Already, simply by bringing these questions to the fore, our institutions will not be able to go backwards to the time when it was what it was. Your generation has already brought change, so please don't let up. And fellow faculty, I know that this work challenges us in almost every way to re-examine what we have been trained to do. After all, to become a faculty member, we are, by definition, victors of the system in place. It can be hard for us to envision a different way. But I would suggest that we embark, embark upon these conversations with our young people by centering our disposition first not in defensiveness, but rather in empathy, in compassion, in recognition that a system that has never been equitable cannot stand without change, and with a spirit of listening and learning. It can be hard to place ourselves in the position of learners, but truly our students are the ones who have the deep knowledge and understanding of injustice right now. And we would all benefit from hearing them and then heading towards action. 
Addressing systemic marginalization in arts education requires a multifaceted approach. We need to strengthen access to the arts for all young people so that zip code does not determine a child's potential for receiving a basic education in the arts. We must decolonize and address inequity within our institutions of higher education to ensure that we have not only better representation of BIPOC and historically marginalized populations within our schools, but also that they are surrounded by a system that supports them, that feeds them, and that values them. And we must not give up. The arts, after all, belong to all of us. Thank you so much, and I look forward to our discussion. So what are you doing at Michigan to address some of these issues? You know, uh, this fall in particular, I mean, this didn't start this fall, but I think this fall, many of our institutions of higher education have um, really been inundated with, uh, with crises on all sides. And I think it is rather a dizzying time for, for all of us, for those of us who are faculty members and administrators, um, and, and again, most importantly for our students. Uh, the, the amount that's happening right now, it sometimes I think feels like a, a hurricane, um, and we're in the middle of the hurricane, and it's hard to figure out uh, you know, where we're headed next. Um, but I think it is, it is really to our students' credit that they have brought these important issues to the table um, for all of us to really consider at the same time when they're going through so much. Um, at Michigan, we had um, multiple uh, petitions, lists of demands from our students and we are a school of music, theater and dance. So we have multiple areas. Um, and I really was impressed and astounded by the, um, the thoughtfulness, the care, the detail, the, um, the suggestions that were provided by our students. Um, and so we have tried to move forward. Um, our dean has done a really terrific job of this, with holding conversations with those students, with making sure that we are um, first seeking to listen and to understand. Again, noting that not all of us uh, have actually walked in shoes that have been marginalized and oppressed, and we have much to learn. Um, We've been holding those conversations, and then we've also been trying to increase student participation within our school. Uh, so we, we were holding um, conversations between students and chairs of certain departments uh, to talk about actual uh, smaller aspects of the curriculum um, that need to be reexamined. You know, uh, lots of different things that are embedded in our curriculum uh, that have been questioned for a very long time. And there are some, um, there are some important issues to take on there. We have the uh, faculty action committee that's doing some tremendous work. We have a DEI um, student committee that's doing terrific work. Um, and we are, uh, we are taking these issues very, very seriously and trying to recognize um, uh, the thoughtfulness that are, of our students and, and, and recognize their knowledge. Um, I will not say that we know uh, exactly what changes are ahead, but ahead, but I think we're um, trying to to um, really be optimistic that these changes are needed, and that working together we can make them happen. And then in the larger um, in in the in the larger community of of elementary, middle school, high schools, what is there aside from lobbying our elected representatives that we as musicians can do to help change some of that the structural inequities? that exist? Yeah, within, within arts education. Yeah, it, it really is, a, um, again, a multifaceted issue from a broader policy perspective. Um, we need to change um, issues of school funding and school funding structures, right? Again, why, why should zip code have to matter at all? Uh, why, why is it that one school on one side of the road has certain uh, access? Uh, students in that school have certain access and a school right across the street on the other side of the road in a different district has different access or different funding or different resources. I mean, that, that's really a huge problem for our society to tackle. Um, and so I think it's really important that we be mindful that those structures uh, still represent a lot of inequity. Um, at the more micro level, um, I think everyone who's listening right now, I mean, you're obviously here because you're someone uh, who's doing wonderful things. You wouldn't be in this school if, if you didn't have a, a terrific musical and academic past and, and you're doing terrific work. Um, but you are voters, 
you are um, you are parents or future parents who will have kids in schools. Um, you are a product of the current systems. Uh, you can advocate at the local level, at the school board level, in your own communities for arts education being basic to the curriculum. And we have some great national policies that recognize arts education as being fundamental uh, to uh, to our academic uh, work. However, that just doesn't always uh, really happen when push comes to shove and principals and administrators are put in really difficult budgetary positions and have to make cuts. So what, uh, what the schools and school districts listen to are taxpayers. Um, so everyone listening can have an impact on their future communities um, as well. The other thing is that from the inside out within arts education, within public school arts, um, we need to do a better job of making sure that the curriculum we're teaching, the opportunities we're providing to students are actually responsive and sustaining, culturally sustaining and culturally responsive um, to our students. Um, our, our arts classrooms look um, really the same way that they did, you know, 60 years ago, um, in, for the most part, uh, in this country. And so um, there are a lot of exciting things out there that can make our curriculum more representative of, of the, the beautiful uh, diversity that we have amongst our students. Um, and just to make sure that we are um, using our positions of privilege and of power to um, bring other musics and cultures into the picture that have been historically excluded. Yes. We have a question from a student, uh, Melvin Robinson. Hi, Melvin. Hi, Dr. Fitzpatrick. Hi, how are you? Doing well, how are you? Good, thank you. All right, I just have one question for you. Um, do you believe there is a pipeline issue for musicians who are people of color, um, well, black indigenous people of color and getting into schools of music, conservatories, into major orchestras and teaching in higher education. Thank you so much for that question. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, that, again, our, our music teaching population uh, looks very little like our student population across the country. Um, but it's not as easy as just saying like, well, we need more teachers of color. Um, when the spaces that are there, first of all, are not often accessible to communities of color, there are existing structural policies that, that need to better address those issues. And once our students get into the institutions, um, that, that we better sustain, nurture, foster, support, um, and see our BIPOC students. Um, and I think all of those are issues that are important to take a look at. Um, I did a, a research study a few years ago with, with a couple of great colleagues um, from the state of Texas, where we took a look at historically marginalized students and their access to and retention within um, programs of music education at three different college institutions. Um, and we took a look uh, to try to recognize what are the barriers that are actually happening uh, to even get people there in the first place. And a lot of them are these kind of pipeline issues. You know, what, what types of robust sequential arts programs are happening in our communities? And, and it's important to recognize that um, our communities of color shoulder a lot of the, the burdens of, of the legacy of, of structural racism that's happened throughout the years. Um, and so many of our communities of color also are communities that do not have the same equity of access to arts education nor to other resources in general. Um, and so these issues are really compounded as we go on. And again, the arts are different. This is what I think we really need to recognize. And it sounds like the Lyft group and, and others are, are taking a look at this. But again, if you want to come to the University of Michigan as a violin, major to teach orchestra someday. I mean, if you're one of my students at Northland who would tell me like in their junior year, hey, I'd really like to be a music teacher. That sounds like something good to do, right? Um, and I have to tell them that really, if you wanted to meet our entrance requirements, you probably would start playing the violin between the ages of four and eight, maybe four and 10, if you really push it, right? And you need to study in these specific ways, this specific literature with these specific teachers for this amount of time. And then I have to look them in the face and say, I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we're there yet. Teachers. 
Um, so it's a real issue that we have to examine um, within higher ed, and, and those of us in music education need to take a hard look at that um, to figure out how to make that access work. Um, the retention is another issue. Again, I, I um, have had a lot of conversations with students of color at Michigan and, and at other institutions as well who really struggle with the climate um, that surrounds them and, and the prevalence of lightness. And, um, you know, for BIPOC students, for all these sort of marginalized students, um, I, th I think that can be incredibly difficult to navigate. We just set up a, um, a conversation that's being led by some of our faculty of color to work with our student, with our BIPOC students, because um, those relationships and connections, I think, are so important. But at least in our school, I don't know the way it is in your school, but we, we, just, we have some of the trailblazing, um, you know, most amazing BIPOC faculty, I feel like, in, 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 uh, in the history of the arts on our faculty. But they're in certain departments, and we, we still, as a whole, have a real problem with, with the demographic makeup of our faculty. So many of our BIPOC students are feeling very isolated, and like they don't have opportunities for that kind of connection or mentorship um, on an individual level. And so we're trying to really bring, bring those, uh, those groups together, particularly right now, when most of what we're doing is on Zoom, and I think the level of isolation is sky high, um, and those conversations are, are really needed. So I really appreciate your question, Melvin. It is a, a tremendous issue and we need to address it on all sides. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Melvin. Rebecca Atkins writes, could you share some examples you have seen where communities have come together to demand or acquire funds for all students to have access in the arts? I'm excited when parents fundraise for salaries of qualified arts educators. However, I'm concerned this behavior allows the school systems to drop their responsibility and rely on those funds, which in essence sends a message that arts are not important enough to fund through the school system. What a great question, Rebecca. Absolutely, absolutely, right? I mean, when I think about my high school teaching experience in, in my community, um, that was what we did. I mean, our, our budget was zero. It was like, you need chairs, you need sheet music, you need whatever. And, and they, they, what they provided for our students was my salary, right? And my salary, my $30,000 salary, uh, you know, they, they relied on me to teach all of our students. And there were, you know, 160 in my marching band and however many more in my um, orchestras. I mean, it's pretty good work in there, right? Um, so, uh, I mean, really, really, if you decimated my instrumental music program, you would actually have to hire many other teachers to replace me, right? Because all, all, in other cases, you're not allowed to have that many students in one room. So th there is an antiquated view that the arts are really expensive in schools. But actually, if you take a look at it again, $30,000 for one teacher, we have 160 students at a time, like pretty decent bargain they're getting, right? Um, so, so advocacy in those ways is really important, but yeah, I mean, we fundraised constantly, and, and these were parents and students who were already working multiple jobs and already, you know, really strained, but um, they, they showed up and they did that, but I have a real problem with it, right? We, we're, we're constantly demanding the labor of people um, who find themselves within unjust systems, and um, I, I think it is a... a real problem. Um, and I agree that we let districts off the hook when we take on that funding. You know, it's really fascinating in my district, um, you know, we literally had duct tape on our tubas to make them work. We had a tuba we called car, or the students called car crash because it looked like it was in a car crash. Uh, we, we had, you know, I mean, I learned how to solder during my time as a teacher in that school because I needed to solder our brass instruments myself, along with the shop teacher in the school. Um, so uh, that that kind of thing um, happens. But in my school, we had so few resources. We had a 25-year-old contra bassoon that belonged to the school, and we had a chest in my room. So th this is always evidence to me that at one time the contra schools did provide funding for the programs. Once upon a time, that was the case. And so school districts will do what taxpayers demand of them. 
Uh, one positive thing I think that's happening right now, uh, you know, there was a wave of cuts in, in the, the recession um, that, that happened, the wave of cuts to arts teachers across the country. And in Detroit, we had that, we had massive layoffs and cuts of music and arts teachers in the Detroit public schools. Um, students would come to school one day and, and their um, music program would be uh, uh, their doors to their choir or band or orchestra room would be locked shut um, and the teachers couldn't even get the instruments in those rooms. And those were really terrible times. But what was interesting is what's happening now, right? So for all those years, there were cuts. Um, but parents were, de were demanding the arts. So some of the charter schools, and we had a ton of charter schools in the area, public charter schools and private charter schools in the Detroit area, offered the arts continue to offer the arts. And the schools were seeing a lot of their funding being taken away by students who were going to those places. So we're in a new place now where the Detroit Public Schools right now has hired a ton of music and arts teachers. One of my former students is the head of, um, of that program um, and is constantly asking, who do you have for us? Who do you have for us? So if there are any music, educator, music educators out there who are graduating, there are jobs in the Detroit Public Schools with good studies if you want them. But they are reinvesting in arts education. And I think it's it's because parents have demanded that. Um, and the schools are seeing that they're going to lose students if they don't provide robust programs of arts education. Because all, all families want their students to be able to participate in wonderful um, wonderful things during their school time. Not just kids in, you know, um, better resource districts. All parents want that for their kids. So... We're seeing some, some good changes there, and I hope um, you are too in your area. Great question, thank you. Yeah, we have a question from David Stanley. If you could unmute yourself and turn on your video. Hi, Dr. Fitzpatrick. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm a graduate student here, and, and before coming, I was teaching in a, an urban environment in a high school instrumental program. And um, I experienced on multiple occasions where that type of um, teaching job uh, was not considered necessarily the good job. Um, in fact, was considered a stepping stone toward a more well-established well or successful program, um, which in, a, in essence was, you know, white suburban programs. Um, and I had some administrators even at, at points say, you know, a, a good teacher here will be a great teacher in the county. Um, at the same time, there are systemic challenges that make it difficult to teach in underserved populations, uh, in difficult teaching environments. So there's a lot of revolving door, you know, not a lot of continuity. So my question is, what can we do in our teacher preparation programs to help encourage investment in these communities that arguably have the most to gain from a music ensemble? Um, and how can we kind of shift the paradigm so that it's these are not just considered stepping stones to the good jobs. Yeah, that's a great question, David. Thank you. And thank you for bringing that up. I mean, I think, you know, I, I was faced with a lot of um, attitudes like that when I started my job. You know, people told me things like, um, well, make sure you lock your door when you leave or, um, you know, uh, don't stay too late at night, which of course I was the person who was leaving the building last every night. Um, and I I found was really the opposite. And so it really um, causes me some distress when I hear those narratives that are out there um, because those narratives are spoken by people who haven't actually been in the communities that they're talking about, right? And, and they don't actually understand them or they walk in and make a staff judgment because perhaps they, they don't look like the students who are there or they, they're, you know, um, they've spent their time in other districts and, and they, they don't actually get to know people and individuals. Um, but I spin on this, and this might just be me, but um, I want our students in under-resourced communities, our BIPOC students in um, urban and other communities. I mean, honestly, I, I don't like the term urban, actually, and I, I can talk more about that later. Um, but I want our, our students in under-resourced communities and our students of color, our BIPOC students, to be taught by teachers who actually know how to teach them and who actually understand them. And there is an issue, I think, um, of cultural competence 
with regards to many of the people who end up teaching in schools uh, where students, where they are different from their students, um, that actually cause harm to students of color and BIPOC students. And that concerns me quite a bit. It concerns me also when we do, um, we engage in community engagement with communities of color um, without helping our students to be culture, culturally competent. And with I, I just think that, um, so I would hope that it gets to be a day where, um, you know, you, you really consider it a privilege uh, to be able to teach in a community uh, such as the one I taught in where, where that is considered to be, um, uh, you know, an honor and a privilege as it really is. Um, but, but yeah, I, I hear that, you know, people, I've tried to bring forth a, a little bit discussion of this notion that um, all great music teaching is contextually specific. And the idea of contextually specific teaching is that it actually is like that you're gonna do well in this school and you're gonna go to that school and you're gonna do really, really well. Um, all teachers, all great teachers, understand deeply the communities in which they teach. And that can actually happen when somebody actually comes from a community, right? So um, when some of my students who went to Northland went back to teach at Northland, like one of my former students is a, an administrator at the middle school theater for my old, uh, my old school. Um, and he understands that community, right? He, he grew up in that community, which is much different from me. I didn't come from that community. So when I walk into that community, I have work to do I have work to do. I need to become a learner within that community. Um, and so um, that I think is, is really, really crucially important. So when I learn deeply in a community, I understand what my community needs. And when I recognize what are the strengths of the students sitting in front of me, what are they bringing to the table? That is when I can start to become a good, a good teacher. Um, and part of the problem is that there's like this traditional definition of success that happens that I think you're talking about. And I have a portion of my book devoted to this where I talk about um, how we redefine those traditional notions of success. I mean, they really come from, I think, especially in ensembles, uh, maybe not as much general music, but in the ensemble areas, you know, we all kind of want to be our college band directors, right? Or we want to like conduct at Midwest and we want to you know, perform certain literature and do certain pieces. And um, I think that's kind of, again, really like the victors of the system that's set up, right? Like we've come through this system that values certain kinds of musicianship and learning. And then we go out and we want to like bestow that upon, upon the communities that we go into. And I think we have to really examine that and be thoughtful of that and say, now, wait a minute, maybe my definition of success in any school, not just an underserved school, but in any school has to be very different from that of a college program, right? And so maybe I'm gonna do some Lincolnshire cozy with my kids and maybe I'm gonna do some grade one, grade two pieces with my kids. But the, the redefining what success means might be that a big program isn't even what I should be doing in that district, right? It might be that there are some other um, beautiful strengths of that community in terms of music. I mean, again, I live by Detroit, talk about the, some of the greatest musicians of all time in Motown. Right? And yet we're not teaching that in our schools. We have some great teachers in Detroit who are, right? But what's the Motown of tomorrow? The kids who are sitting in front of us, what are they gonna be doing tomorrow? Teachers, we're not just band, choir, orchestra, general music teachers, we're music teachers. So I think sometimes we have to try to break free a little bit from how we've been trained uh, to enter into schools and what our definition of success is. I measure a teacher by when they walk in with students, where the students are at in terms of musicianship as I define very, very broadly, and then later where students are at. And if that's the measuring stick, if it's not just, I can tell what a good music teacher you are because of how your ensemble sound. Ooh, that's very loaded because where did they start, right? But if I can look at where you take them, I will tell you, I've seen absolute miracles take place in places like Chicago and schools where other people would not even listen. People would hear some recordings, but we're talking about a particular student in the ninth grade who has never played an instrument before. And all of a sudden they're playing, you know, grade four music. I mean, I walked into Victoria Miller's classroom. She's featured in my book, Victoria Miller's classroom, who just retired after 42 years of teaching in Detroit and still goes every day to her former school to help. Um, I walked into her classroom where 
again, kids are starting with band instruments at the high school level. And I hear students who just started this last year or this current year, and they're playing Overture to Candide. And are they playing Overture to Candide exactly the way that the symphony band would at Michigan? Maybe not. But I will tell you that that teacher every day is going to be my model for, for what to do. So, um, so anyway, we have to change those. It's not easy, but, but it's, it's important. And so I really appreciate your question. Thanks so much. Thank you. So an anonymous attendee asks, what would you say to faculty members who are unwilling to change their thinking about the curriculum and or students of color in general? Hmm. Yeah, um, we're having these discussions right now too. I mean, I, I think it's important. Uh, we, we have to make change and change is coming and change is happening regardless of how people feel right now. And that's what I think is, is kind of happening at the moment. And again, it is a, a, a tribute to the students uh, that who we have who are propelling these discussions. Um, that being said, again, um, we want everyone to be a part of that, right? And, and it is the truth that faculty are products of the system that they come from. And I do think that, I mean, when I look at our faculty at Michigan, we just have incredible, incredible people. Um, and some of them have insight into who has been excluded from within these walls for a long time. And some of them are very thoughtful and, and conscious of a lot of those issues. And some of them just haven't helped to be conscious and thoughtful of those issues because they've never walked in those shoes. Again, I've never walked in those shoes, right? So all of us have work to do, each and every one of us, whether we um, you know, know the right words to say or we don't, each and every one of us has to start. And so I, I am um, wanting to extend a warm invitation to faculty who might feel um, like, again, like they may, might not have the ability to engage in these discussions or might be a little bit fearful of those discussions. Um, because again, these are different, uh, knowledge and understanding coming to those of us who are not from historically marginalized populations, right? So there's going to be a learning curve. Um, now, we have some people, you know, I have a colleague who says, a colleague of color who says, you know, we don't really want to fix your broken universities. And I understand that too, right? Like, um, I think we have to have a lot of dialogue to figure out whether we're going to make incremental progress or we're going to change it all. And, and that's gonna be the way things go. And, and people are on different sides of that. Um, but the, the conversation is happening, it's here. And that's what is to celebrate. And so any way we can push that forward, it will feel uncomfortable. And all of us have to sit in our uncomfortableness. All of us do, all of us have to take that time and say, yeah, maybe I didn't realize this. Maybe I saw things only from my perspective and I didn't understand. Um, what other people around me have been experiencing or going through. Maybe I never really took a look at what I thought I was supposed to teach in this class. And I did that because that's how I was trained. And we say, okay, well, let's take where you are right now and let's figure out how to move forward. And, and another important part of that too, is that, and I'm speaking here um, to my white colleagues, the students and the faculty, who again, have not walked in these shoes. We need to be very thoughtful and mindful of how we engage in these discussions. Um, many of our colleagues, our students, um, those who we love, who are BIPOC, um, may be in very vulnerable positions when it comes to discussing some of these issues, right? When you exist within oppressive systems, it is an unfair burden to have to shoulder the dismantling of that system. And so it is very important that those of us who have not faced those same situations or have not been a part of that oppressive system in the same ways, that we are willing to take risks sometimes to call out these issues, to recognize injustice where it is, um, and to put, put those matters forth when sometimes our colleagues can't. But at the same time, we need to really work hard to step back and to make sure that those who are leading these conversations are those who have actually walked in those shoes and have actually experienced that type of oppression and injustice. 
Um, that is really important. And understanding balance and where that happens is a big deal. It's important that we elevate scholars of color. It's important we elevate faculty of color. It's important uh, that we do that whenever possible. Um, so uh, anyway, I, I think I've gone off of the original um, question there, but just some, some of my own ideas. There you go. Uh, Levi Dean. Hi, Levi. Need to unmute yourself. I know how to use Zoom. Um, so yeah, I'm so happy that you're here and all well, here uh, virtually and, uh, and, and mentally. Um, so my, my question, you know, beyond the idea that, that, that we represent, you know, physically, right, these races or these different cultures, you know, outwardly, you know, music represents a lot deeper connections into our cultural heritage and whatnot. And so within that context, you know, we, we, we talk about this idea that, oh, you know, the music that we have here is so white centered, it is, you know, classical music centered, but how can we really sit there and talk about people of color or those who identify with, with more diversified, you know, cultures? How can we expect these marginalized groups or oppressed groups to just assimilate into our classical music white centered, you know, realm? And, and, and you kind of have mentioned, you know, you've, you've touched on this in the last two questions, but I, I guess my question is, you know, to, to drive this little bit in the direction, how, how can we make some adjustments in music education? I'm sorry, I'm a PhD student here uh, in music education. And so I, how can we make adjustments in music education and in the school, the music schools, in order to make it more inclusive so we can start representing or not, not the fact we're representing, but allow for different representations inside these institutions to then go out and teach music and facilitate music. <laughs> Did I freeze up? No, you're good. Okay. I think it's me. Oh. <laughs> I so, think it's me. Can you all hear me? I, we can, I can hear you now, yeah. Um, I, I guess, to, to, sorry for everyone else, uh, the, the question is really this idea of how can we make adjustments in um, our music programs that are beyond the choir, beyond the orchestra, beyond the band, beyond this kind of generic white-centered ensemble music, and to be a little bit more inclusive. Because, you know, our, our world is based in this kind of like master apprentice, you know, I'm the expert and let me, let me give you knowledge and show you how to play an instrument. And yet, how do we change that role into facilitator and, and learner as, as, as a music educator versus this, you know, this unidirectional, I'm the expert type idea? How, how, how can we do that to then allow for a more free and equitable environment in, in both higher ed or in, in secondary schools? Sorry. Yeah, you guys, that's a, it's a great question. And honestly, it's not, I'm not sure it's one I can answer. I mean, I think I'm learning alongside everyone else right now. And, and you know, I'm in um, my first term as an administrator. Um, and so I'm seeing some different perspectives um, on how institutions work from the inside. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I, think, I think these are just really important questions. I think there's a number of ways we can go about that. Um, and I think people are gonna disagree about the ways that we're going to go about that. Certainly, I'm not sure that anyone can disagree that, that we, we need to uh, decolonize or examine the presence of whiteness in our, our um, curriculum. I, I, I think that's, that's imperative um, because, again, we're, we're schools of music, right? And um, music, as we are currently representing music, is, is just so narrowly defined, just completely narrowly defined. Um, but, but how does that actually show up, right? And how does that actually, how does change actually happen? And I don't know, like, again, I, I had that metaphor of like the hurricane from before. And I think that um, we're in the midst of that hurricane and I'm not really sure which place we're gonna go to to make that happen. Um, I think some of our, our schools are, are not gonna be able to survive this in ways that they would like to, to get through this. and. Um, some of our schools are going to adapt and change and be responsive. Um, but again, that, the responsivity, you know, when people bring issues to our attention, whether it's K-12 students or students in higher ed, what is the response? And that, I think, is, is, a, um, is a crucial question. 
is questioning of existing power structures welcomed or is it met with defensiveness? And if it's welcomed, then conversations can happen. And when conversations can happen that actually have empathy and a, a goal of understanding at their heart, then change can happen. But when defensiveness meets you know, the, the pointing out of injustice, those conversations will not happen. And that's when the system breaks, I think. So I think for all of us right now, we, we are, um, we're at a moment in time where we're, we're having to really question the legacies, the stories, the histories that we've been told about um, this country, this world, the communities that are here, um, indigenous communities, uh, where music uh, comes from, whose music uh, is important. Again, that kind of excellence, I think, is maybe not a bad place to start for many of us. Uh, we've, we've had a lot of conversations about that at Michigan, like, you know, what does excellence mean? And how loaded of a term is that? Um, and and that's a, that could be a good way to start. But, um, but again, I am, I am a learner right alongside everyone right now. And, and I wish there was a great path. I do know that our students will help us uh, figure this out. Um, and so that's, again, why we have to listen with open hearts and, and be responsive and grateful. But I, thank you, Levi. I wish I had a better answer for you. No, no, you know, that, that response is great in the very end. You know, it, I, I, think, I think you're totally right in the sense of looking at the student and, you know, because that's really where it should be focused on rather than, you know, what we want to teach. So it's, anyways, great job. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay, so Dr. Fitzpatrick, we're at time. Do you have time for a couple more questions? Great. Leia Turner asks, how do you engage these communities without the savior complex and white guilt? Yeah, I mean, white guilt, I don't know, but the savior complex, uh, yeah, I think that's really important. Um, long time ago, I did a study in the Chicago public schools, wow, it's been a while, um, where I asked uh, teachers what their motivation was. Um, for teaching in the Chicago public schools. And um, some of them were teaching there because they um, were graduates of the district and they felt like it was a, they felt like almost a mission to go back to their own community or they just really enjoyed being a part of the Chicago public schools. Um, some of those teachers said that they were, um, oh gosh, it's a little hard to remember. Um, oh, that they took the job because they couldn't get a different one, right? Um, and some of them took a job because they wanted to do good things. So there were other um, um, comments made by some of the teachers um, that led to uh, perhaps a little hint of savior motivation uh, for going into underserved communities. And, and I think it's really something important uh, to, to look inward at, right? I mean, I think, again, um, many of us do work in underserved communities. Um, yet we might not actually have a, a, a good understanding of the people with whom we are working, uh, the strengths that they have to offer, and how those relationships can be reciprocal. And I think um, community engagement, just like, um, you know, we have a lot of students who want to go into Detroit and do work, for example. A lot of our performance students, a lot of our composition students, a lot of other students in our school that want to go into underserved communities like Detroit or Ypsilanti and do great work. Um, and uh, so I teach a course on um, social justice in the performing arts. And as part of this course, we talk through these principles of reciprocal engagement within communities. But I think there are important questions to ask yourself before you enter a community. Um, for example, if there's any hint of, I want to go into a community to help these poor people, you are entering with incredibly problematic assumptions about the people who are there, right? Um, even that I want to bestow my music on this community is incredibly ignorant of music that already exists in the community, right? Um, so it, it's really important that we unpack those things. But before we do any type of engagement work or before we get a new job in a certain school district, um, or before we even decide that we want to teach in a certain school district, it's important we do our homework. I really wish um, that every teacher before they took a new job would go in and talk with the secretaries and the custodians in the school and learn 
about uh, what's happening in a school district. I wish we would go and sit in at a lunchroom, notice what kids are sitting together, what kids aren't sitting together, be a fly on the wall. Um, I, in my school, we used to have a lot of like impromptu rap groups that would pop up in hallways. And I remember, again, not knowing a lot about this, like, wait a minute, what's that music that's going on? And then years later, I was like, wait a minute, are, are I the music teacher? Shouldn't I kind of know what music's going on in my school? And maybe not just like Granger and all of that, like maybe I should learn. I know nothing about hip hop. I know nothing about rap. Yeah, I should probably learn a little bit because that's obviously what my kids are interested in. So again, um, reciprocal engagement means that we can provide some things and we're going to gain certain things, right? And it recognizes that there's an equality there on both sides, that um, that going into communities um, is a recognition that can, we have a lot to learn from communities. And learning that before we go, doing the work. I mean, we've had some projects um, between different schools at the university with the Detroit public schools that have not gone very well. And some of the reasons they have not gone well is because nobody went in and actually asked the teachers what they need or what they want. People said, this is the program we would like to gift you, and here it is. And um, I remember when one of those programs was, was coming up and there was a multifaceted engagement amongst various schools. And I said, you know what, I know these teachers. I'm just going to go there and I'm going to say, hey, what do you need? And when I spoke to teachers, they were like, we don't need this, this, and this. We need instrument repair. We need this. I need somebody to give lessons to my kids before they enter our eighth grade admissions process. This is what we need. And that's a lot better thing, I think, to say what is needed here rather than to say, I know what should come here. Um, so saving motivations, other things are involved there, but um, it, it, it's complex for sure. But um, we all have to, I think, enter with with uh, humility and, and humbleness and also just know who we are. You know, I'm never going to be someone different than who I am. And my kids knew that. Like, I don't have to pretend to be something other than who I am. Um, kids are smart. They know when you are trying to be someone you aren't and they know when you're being authentic. And so I think getting really, really comfortable with who you are and then really, really learning who your kids, your students or your community are is an important part of that process. Yes, thank you. And then what are ways that your institution now is reaching out to students of color in low-income communities? Yeah, I think we've got a lot of um, a lot of outreach programs, a lot of different things that are going on. We have, um, I think, just uh, Mark, maybe your work is in this area too. You know, entrepreneurship type of um, uh, programs that provide a lot of different mini grants for students to go in various places, and a lot of those are embedded within communities. Um, I think we have a long way to go. In that regard, um, geographically, um, for example, when I want to place um, students in field work for music education, it's difficult for them to drive all the way to Detroit or to other communities. Um, and so we tend to use schools that are right around us. And so that's a big limitation, I think. Um, and I'm not sure how it is for all of you um, in that area, but um, we need to do a better job with all of that. Um, for sure, uh, we just passed a music education minor um, that focuses on community engagement for non-music education students. And as a part of that minor, there will be a course focused on community engagement, again, trying to get students to be very thoughtful of the ways they engage with communities and the ways that they serve communities. Um, so we're trying to approach those uh, from a, a little bit more of a comprehensive level because they've all been a little scattered right now. But some great things that are happening um, that are really student focused. I mean, this great uh, group for a while back, Girls Rock Detroit, and a couple other things that have been um, really, really terrific. We partner with a group called Crescendo Detroit, which is led by a music teacher in Detroit and is more of a community oriented program. Um, but but um, we are still working on this for sure. Cool. And then one final question, Michael also asks, you talked about the traditional definitions of success, which touched on this a little bit. How can we broaden the music education curriculum beyond the traditional band, choir, orchestra programs to include more musics that align with the genres of music that our students engage with outside of the school day? How can we encourage and prepare music education majors to take on guitar slash modern band slash songwriting, et cetera? Yeah, it's such a wonderful um, question. And, and again, I think that that is really key 
that music education, um, just like all subjects, needs to evolve and change and be responsive and sustaining um, to students, right? Um, and so it is really crucially important that we are constantly uh, taking inventory of what it is that we're doing in our individual classrooms, in our music education teacher preparation programs, in our schools of music, um, in our community arts organizations, to make sure that what we're offering is actually relevant and responsive to our students. Um, but uh, yeah, I think to prepare teachers to do that, um, this is where those of us who are faculty in music education have to do work, and and you have some pretty amazing faculty in music education, so I'm sure they're uh, they're um, right on this. But um, but yeah, I, I think uh, we we still generally prepare um, teachers um, to enter in one of several tracks. Um, I know at Michigan we still do. We're not detracked in terms of choral or general or um, instrumental music education. And there are some programs across the country that provide some great models of, of ways that we might be able to detract, ways that we could get students um, better understanding of different forms of music. There's been a real effort in the last few years in music education to recognize hip hop and its value and importance um, to many of our communities and also its history and legacy. Um, I think there's there's right now a real focus on Black American music and making sure that that is central to our curriculum, not only in higher education, but in our PK through 12 schools. Um, and so, uh, you know, maybe today we think that it's good to offer guitar and piano, and maybe tomorrow it's something different, um, and and maybe it's DJing, and maybe it's uh, you know other forms of. Um, music, but you're absolutely right that if our teachers don't know how to take that on, um, they're not going to be able to teach it. So, um, great, great uh, questions that I wish we could get into more depth on. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. What great questions and great students all of you obviously have. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kate Fitzpatrick.